Greetings, Bedford students, staff, parents, and community members. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to be delivering this address to you in person, COVID still has not afforded us that opportunity to do so comfortably. Therefore, while I hope to be standing before you in person next year, I will need to concede this year and bring the good word to you virtually. As we all know, this last year has been taxing and stressful for our Bedford family as a whole. We have had to make decisions that oftentimes created additional stressors for families and staff. I have appreciated the patience this year and how you have entrusted me to make decisions that are what I believe to be in the best interest of students as well as staff. This doesn't mean any of the recommendations I have made to the Board of Education or decisions we have made have been easy. Having to balance the needs of students, families, and staff has been difficult. There is no decision that will satisfy everyone's needs. I am just grateful that we have made it through and we, seen, we seem to be seeing some light at the end of the very long, dark tunnel. I really was hoping to be able to bypass COVID altogether in this presentation, but I realized if I did that, our reviewers would miss out on the amazing services our staff has provided throughout this pandemic. I think it is important for our stakeholders to know that we have been, what we have been able to provide for our students and will continue to provide as we address the learning loss that our students have experienced. In the subsequent slides, I will be sharing with you our journey through COVID, as well as addressing our extended learning plan, strategic plan, five-year forecast, the current condition and future of our aging buildings, and with that, we'll end with highlights of the year. And yes, there actually have been a number of them. So let's start by talking about how COVID impacted our instructional model. We spent the entire first semester providing instruction virtually to the vast majority of our students. During the first semester, we provided services to preschool and some special needs students on site, ranging from a couple of hours to all day. The amount of time was dependent on the age and needs of the students. On February 1st, we opened our doors to our students to attend in person either two days or four days a week, depending on the grade level. Throughout the year, we, survived, we surveyed parents to gauge their level of comfort in allowing their students to return in person. As a result, we had approximately 42% of our students attend, while the remaining 58% continued their learning online. Today, we are providing in-person instruction four days a week to those students who opted to attend in person. We have continued to offer Bearcat Wednesdays, in which some students are receiving assistance from teachers, participating in small group ins instruction, attending specials, or using the time to catch up on assignments. Teachers use this time to offer small group intervention, plan for virtual and in-person learning activities, and collaborate with their peers on specially designed instruction. When I tell you our team worked tirelessly to provide our students and families with the supports they need, I mean it. I was and continue to be so proud of our staff and the resources we were able to pull together for our families. We distributed close to 3,000 Chromebooks to students and provided families with internet access for those who needed it. Our goal was to ensure that 100% of our students had access to a Chromebook and the internet. We also worked with area daycare centers to ensure that they had the resources they needed. We have a help desk for parents to access at any time and our website has numerous videos and other resources for our parents to access relative to technology. We all know how challenging that can be for those who don't regularly use technology and for those who have not used these platforms before, which is the vast majority of us. In addition to helping students and families, we have provided a number of professional development opportunities for our teachers and students. We have provided tens of thousands of meals to our families, either through drop-off or pickup at numerous locations throughout the four communities. We have provided after-school tutoring for months and learning pods for elementary students at Ellenwood for those parents who wanted to send their children to a safe site to learn. Throughout the pandemic, we have provided for and hosted food pantries, a community resource room for families to get cleaning supplies, clothing, and food. We also provided counseling services, conducted home visits, and found numerous ways to, ways to keep our families engaged. We provided a safe return for students and staff as we created a safety standards handbook, and we ensured that all surfaces were clean and sanitized we placed plexiglass shields in classrooms and common areas, and we, we posted close to 2,000 signs for hand washing, mask mandates, etc. We placed hand, si hand sanitizers in classrooms and certain entrances and common areas. We replaced drinking fountains with touchless water bottle fillers. We offered face shields, face masks, sanitizing wipes and gloves, safety glasses and gowns to teachers and students. We purchased additional high efficiency sanitizing equipment and cleaning products, along with electrostatic sprayers. 
we recognize how important it is to address the effects COVID has had on our students. As a result, we assembled numerous opportunities for our students to take advantage of. Just to name a few, we are offering full and half day summer school options, both online and in person for students in preschool through 12th grade. We are providing meals and transportation for our elementary students. We are also offering tutoring from outside vendors in which parents can choose free of charge. There are also many great opportunities through other agencies, including the local library, that we encourage parents to consider. Our full list of options to parents is available online, along with our plan to address the learning loss experienced by some students. Moving ahead to discussing our roadmap to success, I will take a few minutes to talk about our strategic plan process, final product, and future steps. Advocacy Communication Solution, ACS, worked in partnership with us last year to review data points, determine the needs of the district, interview stakeholders regarding our accomplishments and challenges, and also gathered community input and feedback. The goal of the outreach and interview efforts was to ensure that a diverse set of stakeholders had the opportunity to provide insight into the successes, challenges, and goals of the district in order to ensure that a new plan is aligned with the needs of the district and the community. The goal of the 2021 strategic plan is to help guide the direction of the district and focus priorities on achieving its mission and vision. The district is continuing to build on this goal to ensure it remains current and aligned with the district's students, staff, and family needs, as well as the realities of, the, of life within the context of COVID-19. This plan sets a foundation and roadmap for our programmatic staffing, equity, and social justice and capital investments. Among stakeholder groups, the district is widely regarded to be doing an, an excellent job at supporting the needs of students and families in the community, and many of the initiatives and focus areas of the current strategic plan remain critical for moving forward. Engagement with community members is essential to a school district's ability to develop plans that support and respond to the needs of the community it serves. ACS engaged in, in activities that were both qualitative and quantitative in nature to ensure that the community's voice was heard and incorporated into the district's strategic plan. Stakeholders included school board members, elected officials, parents, scholars, and district residents through interviews, focus groups, and a community survey. ACS worked with us to develop a quantitative survey that was distributed through the Your Schools newsletter via email to the district's listservs and shared by community partners. The purpose of community engagement is to understand opinions about our successes, challenges, and long-term goals. Through the interviews, focus groups, and the community survey, themes emerge regarding how stakeholders view the district's successes, challenges, and future opportunities. These themes are reflected throughout the goals and strategies of the strategic plan, which build upon the strengths and addressing our challenges. At the beginning of the process, our team introduced eight non-negotiables we have as they relate to equity a representation of teachers and administrators after having attended a three-day training in Wisconsin on equity, came back and worked with other teachers and staff to create non-negotiables. The staff had a chance to review them, add input, and revise. The word cloud you see here illustrates the main ideas of the eight non-negotiables. You will see them in a slide later on in the presentation and you can find them online. Taking into account the 2016-2019 strategic plan and based on feedback from interviews, focus groups, group conversations, existing plan reviews, and data provided by the district, ACS recommended these four goal areas. This will help to streamline and focus energy and resources on critical priorities. The next slide will explain our objectives under each goal area. Okay, so here are the goals in which we will focus. Stakeholders universally agreed that student success is the highest priority of the district and community, which is why we have included a goal of increasing student achievement. Equity, social justice, staff diversity, and well-being were also common priorities amongst stakeholders when they were asked about the challenges and opportunities to improve the district. This goal is also in alignment with the district's recent work related to equity and social justice and our vision of providing our students with culturally responsive curriculum and pedagogy. Partners are critical to the success of BCSD, particularly as a way to support communication efforts and information sharing, as well as engaging partners in identifying opportunities to support BCSD programs and students. 
Building additional trusted relationships with external partners will help the district advance the goals in the strategic plan by increasing the district's visibility, expand opportunities for students and families, and increase the network of stakeholders who can be called on to support district programs. Among the many challenges BCSD has faced in light of COVID-19, there was one bright spot, which was the acceleration of the district's goal to ensure all students have access to reliable internet and devices to support their academic experiences. Along with this success, there were challenges that remained related to facilities and infrastructure. BCSD has begun planning for new facilities, which will, will need to be finalized, including the input of broad community feedback. Additionally, the proposed buildings should be reevaluated to ensure they encompass the physical space and infrastructure, infrastructure necessary for sanitation and social distancing now and in the future. After completing the strategic plan, we established goal leaders and committees that included members of the staff, community, and parents. Our goal is to plan our first meeting to establish norms, dates, and expectations prior to summer recess. In order to hold ourselves accountable for completing our action steps, we created a progress monitoring tool and system. Our real work will commence in the fall and continue for the next few years. I always caution putting a deadline on a strategic plan because we know goals can be completed sooner or even longer than anticipated. One of the reasons you didn't see a goal dedicated strictly for finances is that we will embed financial decisions into each of the goal areas. Previously, we had goals related to the financial forecast, but we chose a different approach based on the feedback from the consultants. In any event, I once again have great news to share with, our, with you regarding our five-year forecast, and I am happy to report the news we have been receiving that the past couple of years have been great. We received revenue that we didn't anticipate, and we managed our expenses responsibly. And as a result, we will go yet another year before asking taxpayers for more money. That will stretch us to eight years. That truly is an accomplishment. So to share with you a few more details about how we are faring, this current state budget for fiscal year 2021 has been frozen at the 2019 levels with two exceptions, student wellness and, enroll and enrollment growth. One of Governor DeWine's goals was to increase the amount of funding for mental health services, and as a result, our district was fortunate, fortunate enough to receive close to $1 million a year for the past two years. That funding is expected to continue. The state's portion of the overall budget represents 26%. As you know, the state's budget was strained for various entities vying for the same money, and as a result, in order to balance the state budget, the governor ordered a reduction of state foundation funding to schools by $300 million. Since that time, the state's financial picture has greatly improved, and the governor has signed an executive order restoring $160 million to K-12 school funding. Here you will see our ending cash balance for the previous three years, our current balance, and our projected balance over the next four years. The treasurer, Mr. Parkinson, provided me with this data and information to accompany it. So the question is, why is cash decreasing? So House Bill 920 keeps real estate taxes flat, although the fiscal year 20 state cuts have been mostly restored, funding from the state remains flat, and TPP reimbursements will decline by nearly two-thirds by fiscal year 25 from $3 million in 21 to 1 million in 25. All while salaries, wages, retirements, and insurance costs are expected to increase on an average of 2.6% per year. In addition, overall expenses are projected to increase on an average of 2.2% per year, and the district is expected to begin deficit spending in fiscal year 22. I would like to point out that after seven years of not being on the ballot, we will be ending this fiscal year with over $20 million in the bank. I would be remiss if I did not share with you another contributing factor that has kept us off the ballot. We were fortunate, as was every other district in the state, to receive elementary and secondary emergency relief funds through the CARES Act. As a result, we received just over $1 million, an additional $4.5 million, and now an expected $10 million for a total of $15 million. This money is intended to be used for all costs associated with the coronavirus, including, but not limited to, learning loss, first and foremost, building upgrades, PPEs, and technology. As a result, we were able to use that money instead of general funds to offset the cost of technology and other repairs and the, and the like, and would also otherwise have come from our general fund. So these funds have assisted us in delaying a trip to the ballot, in which we are very fortunate. One of the most common questions taxpayers ask is why they are responsible for funding schools. 
So I think we may have some relief related to the burden taxpayers incur when it comes to school funding. The Ohio House of Representatives voted 70 to 27 for a two-year budget that supporters say would take the most significant step in two decades in addressing multiple court rulings that the state's method of funding K-12 schools is unconstitutional. The House now twice embraced what is called what it calls the Fair School Funding Plan, but its fate remains uncertain as debate shifts to the Senate. The goal of the plan is to determine a district's wealth by looking at local property values and resident income, calculate what it costs to actually teach a student, and attempt to use state funds to bridge the gap. Unlike the current formula, which is too dependent on property values, the new plan uses both property values and resident income to identify each community's capacity to pay their fair share. A district state and local share will be determined by its capacity to generate local dollars. Only a change in a district's resident income, property value, or enrollment would cause a change in the district's local capacity. This slide illustrates the various factors that were taken into consideration when creating the Fair Funding Plan. You will see that money will be added uh, to fund students living in poverty, as well as provide for mental health resources for students and addressing the need for additional funding related to special needs, gifted, and English learners. The formula also accounts for improvement in security and school bus safety. There is an investment in career tech, STEM, and preschool. Fingers crossed that our congressmen and women will do the right thing in funding our schools. Though it appears that I am transitioning away from financing, I am not because new facilities and finances go hand in hand, especially when you're talking about how you will pay for new schools. There have been a couple of factors that have, been, that have forced us to rethink the time frame on building new schools. Some of them include the ways in which COVID has affected the funding for new schools, the unanticipated amount of bond issues that have actually passed, the drastic increase in cost of materials and labor, and the timing of the operating levy with the bond issue. As we continue to delay going for an operating levy, we consequently push back the bond issue. We will have some difficult decisions to make next year as we will balance and monitor the operating needs versus building needs. We anticipate being on the ballot next year, but unsure as to whether it will be for a bond issue or operating levy. We hope to be able to continue to stretch our dollars and ESSER funds along long enough to perhaps be able to vote on a bond issue next year rather than the next, but time will tell. While the time frames for levies may be uncertain, one thing we do know is we need new schools and our students deserve them. We have set the stage for the future of our buildings as we purchased and demolished Chanel School. The building was raised and the landscape has been leveled and prepared. We also sold the Aurora property, which provided us with close to $1 million in our permanent improvement fund. The decision to pay down our Chanel debt or use it for much needed repairs around the district has yet to be decided. We created a master planning committee that has been working for over a year to examine our existing facilities and also work on recommending new ones. There are many decisions yet to be made such as what campuses will we use, what will the grade configurations be, how much money do we need, these and many other questions will be answered with our new task force that will be working over the next few months to present a plan to the community to the community and Board of Education for their consideration. These are exciting times. We ask for your support in making this happen for our students and stakeholders. This is our district and these are great opportunities that lie ahead for sharing facilities with the community as well. There's been a lot happening despite COVID. Aside from plugging away at examining the future of our schools, we spent the year creating awareness and working to gain understanding about social justice and how it impacts each one of us. One of our highlights for the year includes our story, our plan to fight for social justice. Here you see an infographic which serves as an illustration of our roadmap that tells our story on how we got started. Please follow along on our journey. The death of George Floyd was the catalyst for conversation among some of our administrators who had a desire to make a change. This passion led us to establish our logo and tagline, Bearcats Building Bridges to Social Justice. This was followed by our mission, inspiring change through courageous conversations, and our vision to build bridges between our students, parents, and community stakeholders so that we can come together to discuss significant social issues in order to foster a culturally responsive environment in our schools and communities. 
As we started down our path, we, real, we realized that we needed some assistance in completing our goals. As a result, we hired Pastor Larry Macon Jr. to serve as our equity and inclusion consultant. We also recognized a need to help our staff gain a better understanding of implicit biases and culturally responsive teaching and diversity, which is why we planned a well-rounded professional development plan. And included in this were numerous book talks and movie viewings with debriefing and heartfelt discussions around social justice issues. Recognizing that our mission and vision include our stakeholders, we held three community forums in which Pastor Larry moderated. All the while, we were working on establishing a plan. We involved our students and staff in painting a mural in the high school main entrance area, which unfortunately has weathered over the winter. A plan to redo it in another format is in the works. To continue with our learning and to help facilitate that process, we sent Mr. Grudadaria, Dean of Students at Carrollwood, to lead to attend a lead diversity program through the Diversity Center of Northeast Ohio. As mentioned previously, we created a strategic planning goal on social justice and equity, and that goal reads, all BCSD stakeholders will be challenged to engage in opportunities that are culturally responsive and eliminate inequalities. To help hold us accountable in telling our story, we created a leadership advisory team, which you will learn more about on the next slide. We felt we could not put this plan together without involving our students. Therefore, we recently established student leadership groups in the middle school and high school that will address social issues and injustices. Many great things have come out of our work with social justice, including gaining the attention and recognition from the State Board of Education members and the League of Women Voters, as I was recently asked to represent the district as a panelist in part two of a two-part Real Talk education series sponsored by the League of Women Voters called Equity and Anti-Racism in Ohio Schools, Building the Principles, Policies, Programs, and Practices for All of Ohio's Children. I was also asked to participate in a radio talk show through WBIZ and IdeaStream on the topic of equity in education. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story, our plan. But it doesn't stop there. I have a few more things worth noting that you don't see on the infographic. We are currently in early stages of participating in another equity audit process and training through the ESC. We have sent letters and statements to the community in which we took positions. We created awareness and encouraged reflection. Some of those statements included the death of George Floyd, Juneteenth, Black History Month, the attack on people of Asian descent in Atlanta, and the insurrection at the Capitol. Finally, and what really should be uh, should have been mentioned at the beginning of the overview was that the Board of Education passed a resolution on equity with a vote of five to zero. This shows the support of our board to ensure our students are receiving equitable services that address each child's needs. Here you see our diversity and equity framework that can be viewed on our website as well. You will see that we have a structure in place in which we have an oversight committee in which I referred to in the previous slide and we also have four cornerstones that impact our work with equity and have we also have accompanying non-negotiables for equity and social justice. The framework you see here will be merged with our strategic plan and the underlying principles will follow suit and be at the forefront of our minds when making decisions. You will note that we have four cornerstones in which we address e equity. They are focus on equity and social justice which is around the history of marginalization and research also the audit and non-negotiables. The second one is aligning staff and students. This has to do with scheduling and realigning our staff. The third is transforming teaching and learning, co-plan to co-serve. Uh, the fourth is leveraging policy and funding, which is around our equity policy and aligning our resources. The non-negotiables that are listed at the bottom of the framework were drafted in a committee after the training in Wisconsin. They were vetted with various groups and then presented at individual staff meetings for input. We have a total of eight, and in the full framework, you will see icons symbolizing the alignment between the non-negotiables and our cornerstones. Another highlight in which we are proud is our community resource room that opened its doors at Bedford High School in January. This project has been in the works for approximately two years. Our social and emotional learning team took on the task under the direction of Mr. Kenneth Elder and Mr. Sam Vodders, who are administrators in the Student Services Department. The room is stocked with supplies that our families may need to get to help them get through this difficult time 
thanks to generous donations from the National Council of Jewish Women, Mount Zion, Bedford Church of the Nazarene, and Hope United Methodist Church. Supplies were also purchased using CARES Act funds through a grant from the Educational Service Center. Currently, the district social workers oversee this room to distribute supplies to our families. Channel 5 and Spectrum News 1 both did stories on the resource room. Here's a clip from Spectrum News 1. We do. We have laundry detergent. We have a host of things in the resource room. A new community resource room just opened up at Bedford High School. Families call school social workers asking to schedule an appointment daily. We've already serviced up to 12 families. Faith Gordon is 2020's Ohio School Social Worker of the Year. She and other school social workers distribute the items to families in need. The community resource room is actually two rooms. Gordon says the district has always offered support. It's just that this room actually took it to another level. Free clothes, coats, shoes, school supplies, hygiene products, food. Underwear and gloves. Even a washer and dryer. You name it, they've got it. Organized by size and gender in this one-stop shop. The pampers and pull-ups and book bags and just all the supplies, lotion, shampoo, deodorant, soap. This is made possible through CARES Act funding and community donations from organizations including the National Council of Jewish Women. I do not agree with that, um, with the saying of, you know, when you ask for something, you can't be choicy. Gordon loves that this resource can restore dignity to families, break down barriers, and encourage a holistic approach to education. I can't teach the head if the heart is broken. Currently, these community resource rooms are open by appointment only from 9 to 3 on Wednesdays to district families. But the hope is to soon be able to expand the services so that all of these resources will be available to the entire community. For Spectrum News, I'm Michaela Marshall. And here is some more good news to report. Please enjoy the following slides, which are filled with accomplishments of our staff and students. Thank you again for joining me. And please, if you heard something that resonated with you, that you would like to learn more about, or simply just have questions or feedback, feel free to reach out to me. On behalf of the Bedford City Schools, members of the Board of Education, thank you for, you, for all you do to support our students and staff. Take care, stay safe, and enjoy your summer. Thank you.